more than 6,000 undergraduates, 600 postgraduates and doctoral students, complemented by over 500 well-qualified teachers, trained in ICT-enabled teaching learning processes. The clock. Good morning to one and all. It's my privilege to welcome you all for the inaugural lecture. And usually it starts with a thought for the day, which I'm going to uh, bring from Rabindranath Tagore's uh, Gitanjali. Chittu Jetha Bhaishunyo, that means where the mind is without fear. It's written 120 years back, but it rings true every word, even today. Where the mind is without fear and the head is held high, where knowledge is free, where the world has not been broken up into fragments by narrow domestic walls, where the words come out from depth of truth, where the tireless striving stretches towards perfection, where the clear stream of reason has not lost its way into the dreary desert sand of dead habit, where the mind is led forward by thee into ever widening thought and action into that heaven of freedom, O oh, Father, let my country awake. So with those thoughts, we move on to the alumni guest lecture. I'm very privileged uh, that we have Professor Rohan Maskarinas with us, and he is a person who needs no introduction, but yet, because he's also a proud alumni of PG Diploma Bioethics, Medical Ethics, as well as Clinical Ethics, and he's a professor head, Department of Orthodontics. You find a personality with a lot of other uh, expertise rolled into one. He's a researcher, ethicist, innovator. He has got a patent of just about two, three days back, and he's a diplomat of Indian Board of Orthodontics. Is only one in a huge country where about 100 people are there. So that also talks about the hard work and commitment to whatever he has done. And he has also authored a textbook. And he is a reviewer for Annual Journal of Orthodontics. And he was awarded the top reviewer. He has also received research award three times. So with that, we call upon Dr. Rohan to give his reflections, because this particular series is on reflections how the course has impacted you, and in turn, how you are using it in your practice. So I call upon Dr. Rohan. The mic is yours. Over to you. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. That was what uh, we were taught right at the beginning. No? So let's respond to somebody's wishes. That's the first uh, thing that we learn in ethics. So very nice. Good response. Um, at the outset, uh, Thanks, uh, Madam, for uh, inviting me to deliver the lecture today, the alumni series lecture. So it's a proud privilege today. Uh, first of all, let me also address, I think, uh, the Honorable Chancellor who will join us later, uh, the Vice Chancellor and the Registrar. They'll be here a little bit later. Uh, welcome, everyone, including the faculty who are my teachers in the Center of Ethics. The other faculty, the alumni, and the present uh, batch of students. I'm here today to give my thoughts on the impact of uh, doing the course in ethics. So now it was the year 2016. And prior to that, I would always think I should do some course on ethics. And I would always see Madam, I would see Dr. Ravi Vaswani. I was hugely influenced by the way they would you know, interact with people and things like that. <laughs> For some reason, you know, I thought maybe bioethics, what biology is again a big headache, you know, <laughs> it's not our cup of tea. And then again, medical ethics, you know, I had two, three thoughts on that. And then they came out with this thing called PGDC. So diploma in clinical ethics. I said, okay, now I'm a clinician. So let's go and, you know, enroll for this. 
So we got enrolled and came and you know sat here like you all are sitting today. Sat here and the class was full. And then they said, uh, you all clinical ethics, that's it. EGDBA me this side. <laughs> then we realized that you know there are two batches. <laughs> so two batches means you know two different courses. So then we made some inquiries and we saw that you know actually 50-60% of the curriculum is roughly the same. And then it differs between the PGDC and the PGDBA. Oh, then we went and made a request. There were three people from our department. So it always makes sense, I feel, you know, when you have somebody else enrolling with you so that, you know, you can study better, learn better, there is more interest because you'll come from diverse areas. You are coming to a new place. Now you want somebody when you go back. This is, you know, not a daily program. So when you go back, you need to learn, you need to talk, you need to discuss. So it's always good to have somebody along with you. Um, we were lucky enough, you know, we had Dr. Saista who was also there and uh, so not Dr. Momadi. So, Begum, yeah, correct. So, we thought, you know, we need to somehow convince Madam. So, three of us went together and then we told Madam, see, you know, we are interested in both the courses. Can you give us permission? So, Madam said, let's see, you know, we put it up uh, before the, I don't know, the higher, higher ups Good. and then Madam Board of uh, Studies and all that. And they said, let us do this one off. You are allowed to do both the course together. And I think that is the best decision that we have ever made. For me, it is actually transformational. This, this course actually transformed my life, transformed the way I practice, and has been very, very fruitful, joyful. Uh, I'll also go through what are the things that are impacted. Normally, I wouldn't really write down something, but I thought, you know, there are some things that are really impacted. So I, I've written a few points that I should, I think, uh, reflect on. So now this course is about so many things. They take you to movies, they take you field visits, they give you breakfast, they you know give you sweets in between, they do uh, uh, play play acting, and you know it is really wonderful. You'll really enjoy because you know you're sometimes in your own shell, you wouldn't want to come out and do some play acting. You made it to teams, you go on field visits, you see movies, you know, very nice. So, but the first thing they showed us was this cave, and somebody tied. We got scared. What is this like? You know, somebody tied there and on light and all that. And they said, this is the allegory of the caves. Oh, I'm a little bit scared at that time. Then they told us, see, what it means is when there's light from the back and you're only seeing a shadow and the things that the, uh, sh you know, the shadows are made from, you're only seeing black and white. You're not seeing anything else. It does not make any sense to you. Know? It's either black or oh, he's wrong, he's correct. You know? That's all. You know, we have no other opinion. We either condemn somebody or we say somebody is good. Uh, you see, TV debates actually, you know, nobody can take a middle path. We cannot say maybe you know, it was right for that circumstance. You know? We are not looking into that. You know, frequently, you see, these political debates are either just totally right or totally wrong. But actually, the truth lies somewhere in between, what we call the gray areas. So we started looking at gray areas more and more, more and more of gray areas. And with time, believe me, this gray has become. Colourful. It has become very colourful. Because initially grey, you think what mess I got myself into. Earlier my mind was simple. I could just, you know, decide something very fast. Now I have to think about, you know, 100 things. Yeah, am I doing the right thing? Is it right for him? Is it good for him? What is all this? You know, I, I was actually, you know, living a very simple life. And now it's become very complicated to think. But then slowly as time passes, your life will become very, very colourful. will become very joyful. So that is the allegory of the case that you will be told of. And uh, it actually has impacted uh, not only me as a person, but also as a practitioner. Now, we are practicing what? The art of healing. We are practicing art of healing. We also have the power actually to create harm or do harm. So that's why it's very, very important that, you know, we know what is ethics. Ethics is not about something telling you this is a code of ethics. You do this, this, this. No, it's that awakening from within. What you're doing, is it right? You know, that's some sort of deliberation. You need to pause. Sometimes now you see the world is going so fast. Suddenly Corona came. It gave us some time to sit and pause. And with that lockdown period, many were, you know, initially very frightened, very scared. But they're also now sometimes missing that time. We had time. And what we were told, there's a pre-COVID world and then post-COVID world. But later what we see, we're going back to the same things. <laughs> we are not made use of what we have learned. No, we should actually, others is no use. Now, we might learn any amount of theory. If it does not impact your life, it's absolutely no use. So, as you start your journey, you should remember 
whatever you are going to learn, you should in some way, in some way, it should impact you. The way you function, the way you deliver your care, especially we as health caregivers, there's so many questions that come to our mind. You know, somebody comes and asks, should you take vaccination? We don't know what, what to tell. Government is saying, yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, this a home nurse who had a small child, and she was saying, my father told me not to take because, first of all, a small child. Now, I said, this is what the government says, but more than that, I don't know. Earlier, I would say, no, 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 the government is saying, you must do this and you must go ahead with that. But now we don't know. They're saying some other complications are there, but whatever it is, it is only now a matter of choice, which is autonomy. We'll be told about these four principles. You know, as you go through the course, you'll we'll be told about these four principles. I think first and foremost is autonomy. And this autonomy is important for the society because even the US Constitution had this thing called First Amendment, where you are given the freedom to say what you want and to do what you want and to act. As long, what is Mahatma Gandhi? As long as you don't encroach in somebody else's freedom, you have all the freedom to do what you want. And actually, we should not be judgmental. This is what we frequently, you know, somebody does something, we apply our standards of ethics on him. It can be anything. It can be anything. It, it can be you no know, matter of food or matter of watching something or matter of discussion. But we will say, oh, he's bad. He's good. You know, we are judging. So we should come out of that. Slowly we should come out of it. But you have no right to harm others. So your freedom ends where the other person's uh, freedom begins. Next is mindfulness. Mindfulness, I think, is the most, most important. So earlier we were just doing things. I remember we would go with friends, you know, talk about somebody about something and just laugh. <laughs> what what it is actually what you know we're actually doing harm. It, it can be something about you know some somebody who has made a mistake or somebody who's got some you know some sort of shortcoming. But that actually is very wrong. So very with time. We are not that we have not done, but now we are realizing this more and more that we should not uh, just simply do something. We should always be mindful. So mindful means what? You have, have empathy. Empathy and sympathy are very rhyming words, but they're a little bit different. Sympathy is yes, sympathizing for somebody, but empathy is when you actually try to do something. You get into the person's shoes and then you, you try. Because as a healer, they're coming to you. So they want to tell you something. You have to listen to them, not just hear. So unless you listen, even your professional skills will not be improved. So as a professional, you need this empathy. Without empathy, you're not going anywhere. If you're not connected to the patient, you're not going to heal the patient. That's for sure. If you're not going to listen, you're missing what is actually trying to tell you. And, and believe me, now you might think, okay, you do only this, this, and then after that, what? Because we don't see that, you know, see now when there is the two goddesses, okay, Saraswati and Lakshmi. One is the goddess of education, one is of wealth. So you don't have to worry about the wealth. It will come automatically as long as you're doing the right thing. So let it not be that, you know, you're doing only so many ethical things and, you know, this and how will we live? No, it, it's all balanced. Everything is balanced. So if you do good, good will come to you. Nothing's unlocking the mind. So I will show you that, that picture of that man. You know, still I get worried about that fellow. He, he got all chains on his head and all that. And I still tell my PGs, you know. Now, didactic. So many things have been written in textbooks. When was the textbook written? 1960. When was it written? 1970. What are they talking about? Growth and development. Embryo. Uh, fetus, uh, seven weeks, uh, six weeks, uh, that week, this. what kind of scanning methods they had at time? We are not questioning. We are simply saying growth and development, seven weeks like this, eight weeks like that, that thing. So, what actually the methods we use, we don't know. What are the latest studies now? Can you really do? Again, we don't know. Invasive methods are not allowed. As clearance is not got. So, we are teaching as academicians what is there. What, man? It's there in the book. You don't know. 200 grams or 200. But actually, is that the truth? We don't know. Now, if that is the absolute truth, we as academicians should teach that to the students, but we should be convinced. Now, what role a researcher has then? If everything is okay, if that is the absolute truth, let us say like in 200 grams of force to move or tooth is the absolute truth. What is there again to research? Nothing more. The research when you start with, is it really 200? Are there some variables? Can it be more? So then you have a dual role. How do you balance this dual role? That's up to you. No, it's not easy. You're questioning, then what the student says? Hey, he's only asking questions. He really does not know, so he's asking questions and leaving it. But then you'll realize that you can criticize or you can have an opinion only when you know everything. 
you can make everything look very very simple only when you know the whole stuff if you do not know you will not know so you should know okay, he says this he says this he says this but the truth can be anywhere in between now you can see with the vaccination with corona you put mask you do that that masking is no use you know, they have seen this rules change now and then so where is the truth science all the science cdc and all that is full of science only anthony fauci is supposed to be science head but <coughs> actually we don't know where the truth lies but masking maybe yes but other things do we really know hand washing yes so always you know that will suddenly you do something so so they say you can go to theaters nothing will happen open and but we don't know so the truth always lies so as researchers unless we have this empirical data we cannot so we are questioning what is already told to us or what sometimes established you saw it for blood sugar levels you saw it for blood pressure it's all varying the impact of pharma you have seen it's having so as researchers you need to be aware of what are what are this publication in order to make a publication these days you need to know how to upload you need to know a <coughs> vancouver style you need to know how it's done then uh, you need to have your writing skills then you need to have cooperation you have to have good photographs but that actually what can it can do it can actually suppress your real knowledge which you have built or which you observed so early science they would have actually observed i was as a science it was built on observation so it was there so but now we are what we are laughed sometimes you know from like no 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 see you don't do that so it's not good <coughs> don't eat that it's not good for cough or this is you don't do this is not good for your stomach and actually what did we see in uh, we were laughing at them i thought village science some but did we see that during corona time actually we did this home remedies small cough something and all we did pepper lime all those things so many things concoctions we had and we were actually feeling better as it did how many of us actually took other medications we actually we the moment on small running nose now see not anybody running nose no sneezing nothing so what has happened we really don't know but were home remedies useful yes did we really become aware about you know the sports that we should eat should not but at that time we were simply not mindful we were saying okay that is simply something that is known that is a village belief or something like that so we need to open our mind so you should unshack your mind it's very very important so we are some academicians we are researchers we are also practitioners so if you cannot balance all these things ultimately your role is to deliver to the patient you need to deliver good care you might be a academician you are learning what others have told you you are researching and you seeing for yourself and then you need to deliver so the another important role i what i learned is do not do to others what you don't want to be done to yourself now you don't like something you know somebody you know saying something to you so please don't say the same thing to others so suddenly we see a patient you know so oh, nice no wonder everything is nice a little bit so you just soften everything no you don't like somebody simply telling no what you did is not right what you brushing wrong okay i think yeah, you are brushing well maybe you know you can make it better this way so you try to soften up the thing you know you talk to others the way you want others to talk to you you behave with others the way you want others to behave with you so mindfulness is part of it unlocking the mind becoming aware is part of it and also then don't do to others what you don't want to be done to yourself so what does ethics tell us fast moving world science bioethics medical ethics clinical ethics actually has got its basis now on this newer treatment modalities it can be equipment it can be medications or it can be any other treatment modality if it was not there most of the ethical questions would not come sometimes it's about you know continuing life support or sometimes about this uh, newer of vaccinations this ethical questions would not arise most of the times if there was no progress so as we so called you know progress now we are giving vaccinations at andaman island everyone has been vaccinated so now first of all are we counting them as the citizens are we giving them equal rights we are simply going vaccinating them have we told all those tribes do we know their language are those questions actually bothering us at all they have been there since ancient times they have lived a healthy happy life their population is under control they are all healthy nothing is happening we go we are we are mute spectators we do the way we think is right for us we are imposing our standards so now ethics means what is only awakening don't get worried you know because that is some so it's a journey so it's not like something you now you have immediate answers to but at least your mind starts opening up so now 
it will actually make you pause, make you ponder, make you deliberate. What we are doing, is it right? Is it good? Can we do it some other way? Did we do the right thing at all? Should we continue with this? That sort of thing. Next, next thing is impart this knowledge that you have to your immediate colleagues. Don't try to you know, lecture the world and all that. You cannot simply tell somebody, but they want to see it by your own action, the way you behave. Now, there was a lady, you know, uh, a mate, and then she, her way of talking was like that. You know, very, you know, but she thinks that everyone will understand that, you know, she talks in a loud voice and harsh voice. But there was one fisherman who was a little bit properly sensitive. Said, you don't have this fish, you don't come inside. I said, you don't say like that. I could see he felt bad. You say it other way, you know, when you have this fish, you please come in. The same thing you're telling, but you're actually becoming more mindful of him also, of your behavior. So as you see these people and start, you know, telling them and impacting them. Now, this has a positive impact in our department. It took some time. What is ethics and all that? What it is? But then we had a course in Mule Pravaha. We sensitized people about publication ethics. Other people say, oh, I get some company we give. What is the credit you have to give? Nothing, no acknowledgement, nothing. But slowly people are becoming aware. Now we have more staff. Uh, we had this... Um, Puja who's finished a course recently, Nami also who did a course last year and one more PG this year. So as the number of people increase, you know, will become a better world. So you need to actually impart this uh, to your near and dear ones, to your colleagues, to your associates. Now I have you know, some employees in the clinic. So I call them you know, now and then tell them this is how we should you know, think of, which is actually leading to more effectiveness. I think yes. I should not do something just because somebody is observed. I should be professional. I tell them, you know, it will be very professional if you can do something unsupervised, which is very ethical. I say, you know, we have CCTVs, but I'm not going to watch it. I trust that you will be doing the right thing at the right time and every time. It's not only sometimes. So now that has slowly brought about a change in the way that they are looking at things. Now that will also bring us to other changes in our practice. Costing. How much do we charge? Are you overcharging? Are we you know, charging less? We frequently ignore the employee. We say, you know, we keep the salaries same. We don't, and we're trying to give discount or we're trying to take a more profit. So these things need to balance. So we need to make them also partners. So part of business is also in, you know, impacted with this. So it will tell us like, you know, you're giving good quality treatment, charge good, but also see that the employees are benefit. Don't give them as sort of a dole or like some. You, you tell them this is part of the profit that has come out of the good work that you have done. You know, make them feel you know partners in progress, and you will see that everybody it's a win-win-win situation. These other four principles that like autonomy, you know, where you need to give the freedom to the patient. There are many people say, "Sir, I convince the patient." What convince? No, convince the patient. You only tell the patient the facts, and then you let them make that decision. You don't say, "I convince." There's no convincing business at all for anybody, especially now it's a very elective. Uh, proceed orthodontic. So we have this thing, you know, people say, you know, no convincing. We're telling this is a fact and this is what you have. And, you know, we don't put our hand into the patient's pocket. We never do that. In the sense, uh, a Jew was asked, uh, you're very, you know, traditional in your way of approach about praise, about the way you do, but also you're making a lot of money. So yes, we make the patient so, or the person so happy that we don't have to put our hand into his pocket. He will take it out and give it himself. So always keep the patient's best interest in mind. You don't try to judge whether he has the money. We, we actually, the Robin Hood also think, we were actually as doctors, we always thinking that, you know, we should give some discount to somebody. We should overcharge how he's come from New York, we'll charge more, from Dubai, charge more. He's from Papa. No, but that, but that, that actually, I don't think we have uh, to do that uh, Robin Hood business. We need not actually rob anybody to pay, you know, Peter to pay for it. So autonomy is, again, the discretion of the patient which I learned. So you just pass on the information, make them very much aware of what is there, and then leave it. Beneficence. At the end of the day, the patient should be benefited. In the process, we should be benefited. Our employees should benefit. The pharma companies. and But there is no unethical thing in the supplies. Everyone should be benefited. Otherwise, how are things going to work? Beneficent doesn't mean only you know, one benefit. It should be win-win-win situation wherever it is. And in that process, there should not be any harm created, what is called uh, non-maleficence. So I believe when you follow these three things, like the autonomy to the patient, you think of the patient benefit first time and every time. Every doctor who joins 
our clinic I tell them every single time that you make a decision it has to be a patient first there is no second choice about it and they said doctor he said it doesn't have he said that all payment all comes later first you're a healer you just heal because i i have a practice in a center of the town so many big people come but there are also people who come you know don't have money you know they come and and you won't believe it you know they may not have money but somewhere they will go and they will send some patient to you who can really afford and will pay so it always you know this this universe is a, a universe which actually conspires to do what you wish for so you should wish for doing something good so ethics is one step towards that you know religion is also good but it's also compartmentalized at some point you are saying that this is my religion though we are no rule i have become a catholic or a christian not out of my own choice because my parents were and because they have baptized me before even i was given the right to vote the right to marry but then i had the right to choose my own religion and i don't have the right to change my own it does big issue every one of us are compartmentalized by those things whereas ethics is one step i think you know it, it at least it frees you from your thinking we cannot actually they are not going to church and then again we don't know where the barriers of where you can but things like that will happen very so there is a social problem also there as of now but at least we can unlock our thinking consent always cannot be got you know, written though it's desired so sometimes verbal consent in the indian context now you see the western countries when they make uh, songs they make a lot of songs and it's individual but in india somebody writes the lyrics somebody sings and then somebody else again acts you now we have playback singer we have lyricist and then we have so we do things a little bit differently so we are taught of ethics now as in the current form which is i think you know post dating the second world war most of the things that happened were you know after the atrocities were done but we have our ancient civilization ancient history if you see that uh, atreya anushasana or the missing uh, shushruta samhita they are actually predating 7th century bc and things like that so where they also had a high quality of debate so atreya anushasana was also about you know having a debate like socrates uh, from greece now they had this uh, way of debating so you need to debate and then only when you debate deliberate and then are mindful we can actually increase the stand of care so the standard of care is slowly being ingrained you cannot do something good to only somebody like somebody is saying our root canal instruments no, so we only do it once in the morning so no it, you have to do it for every single patient no? or you don't do it. tell them I'm sorry you are not off it's you no know, simply you no know, one patient to see another one no we have enough sets so you no know, said no by enough sets no more everything is stand of care is, has to be the same for everybody you may not be able to charge you may not be able to pay that's not your concern but you have to deliver the same stand of care so these are the things that will actually be slowly ingrained into as you in progress and then when we come to what are the needs for the day university we need to do some research we need to do publication and there is a lot of you know sometimes of frictions happening because of that there have been some mistakes that have been made one of our thesis was there was lying so after many years somebody came he sent it as a corresponding author he sent it for publication some of there was a mix up and this corresponding author's name came as a first author and then any number of communication then we could not change it but that was a mistake that did happen but we should be aware of these things right at the beginning publication ethics so ethics is about everything it's not just about some things coming to research patent now i myself have nine patent applications out of which one was granted just yesterday and that also had a small story uh, so there was one pg whose brother was an in initial science so he did all the work about this robotic positioning about matlab matlab is a software edge detection technology all the things he did we provided the idea sadly his name is not there now when i look at it we don't know why we don't know because we are not mindful it's not that we were you know wanting to exclude him now when i look back i think anita also done her of course but it's not like willingly we did that because we are not mindful at that time he did all the hard work for her she is a student she has to do she has to go tell him brother no so her brother will do only one sister whatever she tells she has to do he did everything he gave her her publication and then you know, he went for uh, patenting and see you know, his name is not there. but did we do the right thing no but can we change no but at least the best thing we could do is at least tell him you know we regret what we did we should not have done that's the next best thing that we can do you know telling that 
very sorry about these things. So, India will do things differently, I told you. So, we can adapt some things from what we are learning. We will be taught so many things. You know, you can adapt it the way you think fit. And progressively, you can, you know, change with time. So, ethics is a journey. Like a good traveler is never really keen on arriving this. He is just enjoying the journey. So, ethics is a journey. You will see ethics in so many things. You know, when you see newspaper articles, you will see ethics. When you see politics, you will see ethics. You know, when you see something about research, vaccination, you start seeing ethics in so many things. So, it's a very, very fruitful journey. So, I wish you all the very best. You know, you have done a fantastic thing by joining the course. I know the alumni also had a real good time. We had a 2016 batch. We had a fantastic time. Same place. We used to have breakfast. We used to watch the one day there was a spider, you know, coming. Afternoon time, you know, trying to keep the eyes open. <laughs> huh? uh, so, we had really, really play acting and all that. So, it's a really wonderful time that you will have. So, enjoy your journey. Uh, it has transformed me as a person, transformed me as a professional. And uh, many times you'll be thinking, ethics, ethics means, uh, what about the... I really don't want to speak about it, but if you're doing good things, if you're doing with a clear mind, that money will just follow. Many times you're, you might use the money you, the way you want. Somebody might buy a very expensive watch. Somebody might buy, it, it's your freedom, it's your autonomy. Somebody who wants to give it and do something good to somebody. Even when you're doing good to somebody, somebody says you're selfish because you're doing it to fulfill your own needs. You want to be happy, you want to go to heaven, so you're giving. But that is your choice. So don't be under the impression you go all ethics, ethics. No, no. Everything that you do, if it is good, if it is true, because we are part of the universe. We cannot say that we are devoid from this universe. So as long as you're part of the universe, you have to accept that what you do will have its impact on, on you as a person. You know, keep you happy, joyful. So I really wish you a very, very joyful uh, course. And uh, also to my alumni friends, uh, thank you to, for attending. Thank you, ma'am, for inviting me. Thank you. That was quite reflective of how ethics has impacted your practice and how in turn you have made necessary changes. Of course, the fact that you were also oriented to having a standard care from beginning. But it's also important what Dr. Rohan said that you don't have to run behind money. It comes automatically once you have a care that is of good quality. And he also brought in the angle of professionalism where quality stands for ethics. In other words, when patients come and you don't practice quality, it's like shortchanging them. That itself can be unethical. So we can always make efforts in that direction. So it was very nicely brought out. We also have Dr. C.K. Ballal with us here, who will be speaking after the inaugural. So we welcome you, sir. We also welcome Amar, who was there. And uh, we uh, actually, we should uh, say that uh, we, have been with, uh, we have been enriched by the students who are a part of the group. Because uh, Dr. Vijay, Vijay Lakshmi, again, from our first batch of uh, PGDBMA batch. So we also have some of the faculty who are teaching, like Dr. Uh, Elena is here, and also we have Mudas here. So the question is, how have we benefited? Teaching is not one-way process. It is two-way process because it's our thought that impact you and in turn you give your thoughts on it and we try to decide what is right from wrong, which uh, suits in a particular context. The same cannot be applied as a cut paste on another context. So in the first batch itself, we used to have such discussions that at the end of the day, four o'clock, five o'clock, we used to leave from here, go to Ocean Pearl and then try to stay. The Vijay Lakshmi can talk about it because she was in the first batch. And what started as a kind of rethinking. <laughs> <laughs> so it was a never ending question because that was the very first time we were trying to seed uh, ethics ideas and there were a lot of why, why not, how, how then and how will it improve if only five of us are ethical, how are we going to change the world and so on. But that enriched us. It enriched us to show the pr proper direction as to how, because everyone giving their ideas added on to the cumulative learning. And that is why we feel proud when we have a huge alumni, we have added to the national base of ethicists, research ethicists, bioethicists, and technology assessors, and so on. So for that reason, I think it's a proud moment for us 
having more than 135 alumni. And uh, so, is there any reflection anybody would like to add just for a couple of minutes? We still have two, three minutes. I'm keeping my eye on this. Like what made you think that you should do the course? Anybody? Nasil, you want to say? Because she did PG diploma and very, very next year she was doing master's research ethics. So, yeah. yeah. Um, Literally, it was because of PGDAT, uh, PGDAT that inspired me to take up masters in research ethics because you know it's a never-ending topic and there is no stop in learning. Every day you will tend to learn new things, and especially like I'm from an administrative field, so there also we get to know a lot of things. You know, like policy making changes, what is right, what is wrong. So yes, it was though challenging, but very. okay thank you because that is the interest that continues on and on and one of the things that really inspires me and a lot of us who are here is an attitude of lifelong learning learning doesn't end just as our shopping doesn't end just as our eating choices food doesn't end similarly our cerebral feedings should not end we should constantly think how best we can take it on further. Because I'm also impressed by when Mudasir comes and tells, ma'am, what do you course? Karna hai? I need to register for something. Because some of us feel literally left out. Vandana Raghunath from Nellore is one such. Constantly from five years, she has been with Center for Ethics. PGDBME, PGDCE, she even took a fellowship. Now she's asking, make online masters I want to join. Same with Vijaya Hegde, who's from uh, AJ. We have a bunch of PGs. Every year they come. Because she feels, along with post-graduation, if you do your ethics, then you will have a better practice in patient care. So that is how people have deep-rooted ethics in their own way, in their own uh, understanding in clinical care, for which we are all grateful. So thank you. And soon, Chancellor will be joining, and we will be moving towards inaugural. Vice Chancellor Berlin. Vice Chancellor Berlin.
The Islamic Academy of Education was established in 1991 by Mr. Yenapoya Abdullah Gunhi, an entrepreneur philanthropist with a vision to provide quality higher education. As a non-profit trust, the Academy established Yenapoya Dental College in 1992 and set up medical, nursing and physiotherapy colleges subsequently. Over the years, institutions developed by this trust have created a niche in healthcare education not only in hinterland of Mangalore but also across the globe. In recognition for this contribution to the education system in the year 2008, the Ministry of Human Resource Development on the recommendation of the university grants commission conferred the deemed to be university status. Yenapoya University thus became the first unaided deemed university to be established in the Dakshina Kannada district of Karnataka. The university, following the accreditation in 2015 by the National Accreditation and Assessment Council with an A grade, has diversified its academic province and scope by establishing Yenapoya Pharmacy College and Research Center and Yenapoya Institute of Arts, Science, Commerce and Management in the year 2017, the Yenapoya Ayurveda Medical College and Hospital and the Yenapoya Homeopathy Medical College and Hospital in the year 2018, the Yenapoya Institute of Allied Health Sciences and the Yenapoya College of Naturopathy and Yogic Sciences in the year 2021. Yenapoya University has secured accolades by various national and international certification and accreditation agencies. The significant ones being consistent ranking within 100 by the NIRF for Good morning, one and all. It's a proud privilege for me to have the inaugural of the 12th edition of the PG Diploma Bioethics Medical Ethics and also the alumni lecture. And to begin the day, as the prayers go down, the blessings come uh, to go up and the blessings come down, I invite Master Zed Zubian to give the prayer. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إياك نعبد وإياك نستعين اهدنا الصراط المستقيم صراط الذين أنأمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين Amin. Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Rabbana la tu akhidna in nasina au akhtana. Rabbana wa la tu hamilla ma la taqatalana bi. Wa akhwanna. Wa ufirlana. Wa rahamna. Anta maulana. Fansunna ala al qawwil kafirin. Oh. 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 It is not righteous that you turn your faces towards east or west, but it is righteous to believe in Allah and the last day and the angels and the book and the messenger to spend your substance out of love for him, for your kin, for your orphans, for the needy, for the wayfarer, for those who ask and for the ransom of slaves to be steadfast in prayer and practice regular charity to fulfill the contracts which ye have made and to be firm and patience in pain or suffering 
and adversity and throughout all periods of panic. Such are the people of truth and Allah fearing. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the prayer. So I request our Honorable Chancellor to declare the alumni series open. Good morning. I am immensely happy to inaugurate the 12th edition of Postgraduate Diploma in Bioethics and Medical Ethics. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. It's my proud privilege to welcome for this uh, 12th, inaugural of the 12th edition of PG Diploma Bioethics, Medical Ethics, and also the alumni lecture. John F. Kennedy said, the success of any school is measured by the contribution of the alumni that make the national life. And we are proud to say, we have added a huge national base for ethics experts, researchers, as well as technology assessors. Whenever the alumni are carving a niche for themselves and furthering the objectives of center in healthcare ethics, clinical ethics, medical ethics, research ethics, we are filled with pride. With those positive feelings, I extend a warm welcome to our Chancellor and Pro-Chancellor who have been supportive from day one in establishing the center and regularly finding out how the set objectives have been materialized. And to our Vice-Chancellor, a man of wise words and decisive action and great counsel. To our Pro-Vice-Chancellor and our Registrar, who has been the facilitator for any academic endeavor tirelessly, and to our controller of exams, finance officer, Dean of Yanepoya Medical College, who has given a constant support, and to all of our alumni who make us proud, and to the alumni speakers for today, Dr. Rohan Maskarinas and Dr. C.K. Ballal, and the students of PGD BME who are entering the course from tomorrow, guests, dignitaries, colleagues, and friends. I also welcome our teaching faculty our one-time <coughs> students who have taken up the responsibility of moving the Center for Ethics forward, like Drs. Ravi, Uma, Unam, Abhay Nirgude Sir, Rishma, Imad, Mudasir, the visiting and the adjunct faculty like Dr. Amar Jesani, who have inspired us to start and have been with us with every endeavor of ours, with every program that we run. And also to Dr. Arun Bhatt, Mala Ramanathan, Anand Pan, and Dr. Roli Mathu from ICMR. I also welcome Professor Vibhuti Patel, a name to reckon with. If you think of gender, you come up with the name of Vibhuti Patel. She's a constant source of ideas, again, pushing the uh, Center for Ethics in the direction of gender ethics. I welcome one and all to this reflective narrative from alumni. I close by reiterating the famous words of CEO Narayan Murthy. Nobody is bothered more about an institution than its own alumni. I wish each alumina fondest memories of the center and hope to see you more and enrich the other alumna accordingly. Thank you so much. With that, I request Dr. Uma Kulkarni, the alumni of the first edition of PGD BME and the faculty at center to present the Center for Ethics report. Respected dignitaries, faculty, respected dignitaries, uh, faculty, students, uh, and everyone who has uh, gathered here today. It's my proud privilege to present before you the journey of Center for Ethics, uh, the 12 long years of nurturing, crawling, walking, running, and a huge leap to go. Uh, 
uh, if you happen to look into the website of uh, Center for Ethics, www.ethics.edu.in, the first thing that will come to your notice is this beautiful logo for Center for Ethics. So I thought this is a good opportunity to introduce this logo to you. This logo was artistically created by a team of enthusiastic undergraduate medical students of Yenakoya Medical College to depict bioethics as a harmonious amalgam of healthcare, environment, and ethics. Please do not miss the DNA helical structure in that, the embryo seen hanging from the tree, the animals, birds on the tree of healthcare. CFE strives to bring about a reawakening of medical ethics and bioethics. So why I have stressed this term reawakening is because when you go and speak to people and ask them, do you want to join a course in ethics? The most constant answer that we receive from them is what is there to learn in ethics? We already know about it. So it's more about reawakening rather than teaching ethics. Uh, how did it start? In 2011, February, the Center for Ethics was established with Dr. Veena Vaswani as the brain and heart behind the establishment of the center. She completed her MA in bioethics from the Erasmus Mundus in Europe. And after that, she came here and uh, this great idea of starting the Center for Ethics was hers. And it has really taken a good shape after 12 years. Uh, there are many firsts in India for the Center for Ethics. Center, this is the first cent, dedicated center to, for ethics education in a medical college in India. There was, there's no other center which is, is placed in a medical college dedicated to ethics education. It's the first to start the PG diploma in bioethics and medical <coughs> ethics and consistently running for 12 consecutive, consecutive years. It's also the first center to start clinical ethics course. There's no um, known clinical ethics courses running in India. It's also the first one to receive an educational grant from the NIH USC for the research ethics program in India. CFE therefore continuously strives to venture into new ways of imparting ethics education in India and has really been successful in doing so. So this was the first batch in which me, Ravi sir, Rashmi Jain, uh, Vijay Lakshmi, eight of us joined this course as, as if we didn't know anything about ethics, we wanted to learn so much about ethics and we were the first batch of eight students. Uh, it was a completely different experience and we have learned a lot from that uh, year onwards. It's not just the degree that mattered, it's the learning that has happened from that year. And there were many batches which have come after that. We have 125 and more PG diploma graduates from a Center for Ethics and we are still counting. Uh, in the year 2011, we had two MOUs. The first one was with Johannes Gutenberg uh, University, Germany. Uh, the first Indo-German CME in uh, clinical ethics was uh, conducted. Student exchange program, international student exchange program started. And they also started a certificate course in clinical ethics consultation. This was proposed. The other MOU was with the Duquesne University, Pittsburgh. In 2011 and onwards, we had a lot of student exchange happening between Germany and uh, uh, Yenapoya. More than 50 students have visited and they have taken part in observership, in clinical observership in Yenapoya Medical College, visiting various departments in the clinical uh, site and learning a lot from them. Apart from that, two students from Yenapoya and two faculty members have visited Germany to, uh, for some kind of observership and training program. In uh, 2012, the first uh, batch of uh, certificate course in clinical ethics started in which again we joined a few of them who for completed PG diploma, bioethics had joined. This later got upgraded as PG diploma in clinical ethics in 2014 and uh, innovative uh, teaching through teleconferencing was the first time even before COVID we had thought of it and we had uh, taken part in it. 13 students so far have taken part in the uh, clinical ethics program. 2012 onwards, we have intensive uh, summer workshop in ethics and research, which is called ICEWARE. This is an annual research ethics workshop conducted, which includes the ICH GCP training. Students, faculty, EC ethics committee members, social scientists, lawyers, and many other people have taken part in this workshop and have benefited from it. Mangalore and beyond, Karnataka and beyond. We have had people coming from various fields and areas 
taking part in this research ethics program. More than 250 uh, faculty and individuals have taken part and benefited from this ice well. 2015, oh, sorry. Previous slide, 2015 onwards, we have started value added courses uh, in bioethics and environmental ethics for the uh, undergraduate students, as well as uh, clinical ethics and medical humanities for undergraduate students. With, uh, it was initially not called a value added course, but this course was started for them. 64 students have taken part in the value added course in bioethics and environmental ethics, and 45 students have taken part in clinical ethics and medical humanities. A lot of uh, activities uh, which uh, teach these students about ethics, including posters, walkathons, and skit competitions, which they have won an award at Father Muller's uh, Medical College, are the highlights of this program. 2017, uh, the uh, UFIC master's program in research ethics was started. This is again funded by the NIH uh, Bethesda USA. This is an educational grant which supports a master's program for a period of five years. It has been approved by the Health Ministry Screening Committee Minister of, uh, Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. 32 students have enrolled in this program. And as we see in this slide, 18 students have completed and they are so happy to carry their dissertation projects in their hands. Uh, we use different teaching methods for the students, undergraduates, whether they are uh, young undergraduate students or uh, faculty members or uh, uh, as senior as me and uh, Balal sir. So we create new platforms, learning pla platforms and learning opportunities in uh, ethics. So including role play, watching movies, visiting the palliative and uh, Sneha Southern and HIV centers and qualitative uh, methods and group discussions and so on and so forth. This is Encircle. This is an Encircle club, ethics club of uh, Enipoya, uh, which started and we had the uh, activities regularly. It has stopped for a while, but we wish to start again. Once again, we had a lot of activities, including uh, World Water Day and uh, many other observations relevant to environment. Um, uh, Center for Ethics has got many international collaborations, including Johannes Gutenberg University, Germany, Dukides University, Pittsburgh, Monash University, Australia, a Mexican University, and the Turkish University. And uh, many, uh, there's another national uh, collaboration with Narayan uh, Dental College, Nellore. We also conduct ethics committee mentoring program, and we have conducted in several places, including Shimoga, Belgaum, Davangere, Dharwad, uh, including Nellore, Bangalore, Mysore. So many places we have visited and conducted these programs. Um, also, some awards and recognitions. Uh, uh, Vina Madam has received an award, and we got a Pachak Pachakucha award at the GFPR. And uh, ethics committee has received for cap recognition as well as NABH recognition. <laughs> is also a member of the United Nations uh, Academic Impact and has also taken part as a host for the International Association for Ethics Education. Next. Um, ethics, uh, the Center for Ethics has also um, uh, felicitated and uh, given a Lifetime Achievement Award to two distinguished uh, ethicists. One was um, uh, Ruth Macklin and the other one was Dr. Vasanta Muthuswamy. And uh, uh, that's how we have uh, tried to recognize international people uh, who are in ethics. These are some of the international visitors to the center. <coughs> some more. And uh, whenever the visitors come to a center for ethics, we don't give them gifts, but we take, they take them to the gardens to plant the sapling. So these are some of the pictures where sapling so that there's a green initiative and keeping environment in the center. Uh, these are the international faculty for Center for Ethics. Norbert Paul. This is our national faculty. Uh, Dr. Amber is here, Dr. Mala, Arun Bhatt, Anand Tuman, and uh, many others. And this is the in-house faculty. And the team from CFE is incomplete without uh, Farzina, Bedavrat, Nahida, Pradeep, uh, Sachin, Shankar, and many others. And this is the future to have a 
to have a community based research and to improve healthcare literacy to bring about quarterly biannual bi newsletter training program for transgenders and koragas starting many research ethics advanced research ethics programs to start phd and fellowship program and to start ethics technology and innovation unit and it's not just what center is doing alumni have achieved a lot uh, three of them are heads of bioethics centers, Dr. Vandana, Dr. Nagesh, and Dr. Vikram. Many are ethics committee members. They are edit on the editorial board of the Indian Journal of Medical Ethics. They are faculty at Center for Ethics. Uh, or they, one of them has authored a book on bioethics. Don uh, a batch has donated books to, of philosophy to Center for Ethics. And some of them are members of uh, scientific review boards. So uh, with that, I end this program. And wishing the Center for Ethics of many more glorious years uh, in ethics education. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you so much. <coughs> and like I said, the thousand mile journey begins with a step. This would not have been complete without the alumni who have been the literally the uh, actors behind this uh, Center for Ethics and who have taken it forward. So I request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Vijay Kumar Sir, to deliver the address. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, sir. Respected Chancellor of NAPA Deemed to be University, Registrar, and my colleague, statutory officers, Director, Center of Ethics, all team members of the Ethics Center, alumni of the center, present and future students, and most importantly, the speakers of the day, Dr. C.K. Balal and Dr. Rohan Maskrinas. I wish you all a very good morning and also a very good day to go on from the ethics point of view. When Dr. Ravi Vaswani met me to be there as a guest today, what trans transgressed my mind was only one thing. First thing that came to my mind was, which I read long ago, I think it's an editorial by Harvard University, some journal, I don't remember. But I remember what is written there. Unethical medical practice is easy to do, difficult to detect, and very easily justifiable. These are the three sentences which I can never forget. I repeat, unethical medical practice is easy to do, difficult to detect, and easily justifiable. And for that, I remember what he has written earlier afterwards also, a good example they have given. That also I remember. When a patient is sitting in front of you with a, say, a headache of 10 days duration, you wantonly mutter a word, humor, and then say MRI brain, without any hesitation, the patient will get it done because you are very subtly used the word humor, which has hit them very badly, and they will get the MRI. You know very well the result of the MRI is going to be negative. That is why he said it is very easily justifiable and very difficult to detect. It's very subtle. The patient is happy to get an MRI which is negative. Right? So this is the example given and saying that that prescription of MRI was intentionally done, knowingly done, when it is not required. This is what the whole content of that editorial in the Harvard University is, uh, I think it is a newsletter. But this is what is happening every day in our practice, every day, I will say. And more so, the more and more technology comes into the picture. For example, today, in my, my speciality, uh, if I don't ask PET CT, I am considered as uh, obsolete. But knowing very well, PET CT is not to be done in every case. That's what the NCCN guidelines is talking about. So, 
I really do not know whether I should go and teach everybody where it's, uh, the PET CT should be done or should not be done. And that is where we are leading. And obviously, it is most of the time dictated by two terms. One for your purse and two somebody else's purse. Meaning the companies, the pharmaceutical companies or the diagnostic companies which come and teach you they teach you what to write, not science of it, but luring you with a, I don't know what language I have to use. I am very, very strong in these words, this side. So that is why I try not to come for this sort of meetings. Because I uh, will be so open that many people will get upset with me. But it is actually a medical fraud, if you ask me. It's a medical fraud, knowingly we are doing. I can keep on giving examples. Examples after examples, I was talking about the MRI, now I talked about PET CT, we'll come to cardiac. Very clearly it is written in the guidelines that when to, when to stent and when not to stent. And they are putting now four stents asking that I can stent, why not I stent the fourth one? They can put fifth stent also. God has not given one more artery there, otherwise they would have done. That is how things go on. We are trying to justify using our intelligence. That is the unfortunate problem. In our country, many, many times I feel uh, intellectual uh, or intellect has become a negative for us. We start using brain too much for our personal self growth rather than for the patient centric activities. Unless we move towards patient centric activities, this is not going to stop. This is not going to change. And giving excuses is very easy. If I don't do, the other person will do. It's very, very standard. Uh, answer given by many of my colleagues when you say why you are doing this when you know very well it is, should not be done. If I don't do, somebody else is done and will do. But this sort of excuses cannot be an answer for the unethical practice. Unethical practice has crept into us in such a level. The ethical practice is being laughed at. Ethical practice is being called as old, obsolete and residue. So somebody is going to resect soon me if I continue to talk in this tone. But the point here is that somewhere we'll have to make a beginning. Somewhere somebody has to get up and say uh, the right is right and wrong is wrong. If that amount of power we don't have, I have to again quote, when I start talking, a lot of quotations will come. I need to prepare and come. If you are not going to say no to something which is not to be done, then you are part of the ill. So being silent is not going to be the right approach. You are a part of the evil. You have to get up and say this is wrong. This is right. What to be done and what should not be done. If we do not do that, again I am telling you can't say, no, no, I am not taking money. I am not doing this. I am not. We, you are a passive partner for that, if not an active partner. Because we always talk in tobacco, you say it's passive smoking and active smoking. And I don't know how many of you know, the incidence of lung cancer, 12% is equal and active partners and passive partners. So, whether you are a, a passive partner by saying, keeping quiet and say, no, I don't, I didn't say yes or no, so I am not a party. You are a party. You are a part of the traffic, you are the traffic. When you are a part of the traffic, you are the traffic. So you can't say, uh, no, 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 I didn't do that. Please, please understand. Somebody else doing something is not the right way to do. Many times I have said this, even in my own practice, I have told, I have to quote now what we wrote. Doing something, what is done by others, irrespective of what is right, is uniformity. But doing what is right, irrespective of what others do, is the morality, is the ethicality. So you should be ethically correct instead of telling he did it, so I did it. He said it, so I did it. Uh, somebody else do not decide what car I have to buy. Unfortunately, today that's how, no? The, your, the TV of yours is uh, decided by the neighbor, not by you, right? Somebody else's uh, decision of buying a BMW has made a decision in yourself. So in small things also, we are not taking our own decisions. And where is the question of taking big decisions here? And it should be from a small activity, you should start saying what is right, what is wrong. 
and i am happy that you are all here to learn the ethical part of it in a ethical way and probably in a structured way i learned it as an old timer in an unstructured way my own we are all autodidacts i don't know how many of you know what is called as autodidact autodidact is self learning we did self learning so uncoached right even in sports we were all uncoached those days today it is we are coached so maybe you will learn it better maybe you will learn it in a more structured way but how you learn does not matter it is like this whether you chose your partner or your parents chose your partner after the marriage it is the only one goal you have to lead a proper life if you can lead it well and good whether i am uncoached and you are coached ultimately you have to practice what you learn it is not for the sake of a diploma uh, a certificate what you are going to get you have come here if you ask me then that should then you should not be sitting here at all the purpose is not served by this getting only a degree and not practicing that and in fact that is worse because at least you can't now say i am ignorant what is ethics now you know you have gone through it so you can't say i am ignorant that much uh, you have to accept that you are you are knowledgeable then you have to put your knowledge into action everything ultimately starts with a thought process is it not so it starts with a good thought the thought becomes a word and word becomes an action action becomes an habit habit becomes a character and character is you you must know that it everything starts with a thought process and with a good thought you have come here and that should continue you should not stop going outside lastly one sanskrit i don't know whether you know that there is something called as people will say i don't know you will whether you will understand it's there in kannada also purana vairagya mashana vairagya prashava vairagya they say i like i will translate when you go to listen to somebody's mythology story who oh, i should also be like that person you take a decision so also when you go to a, a, a place of funeral you will see see what you ultimately died everything is philosophy you speak and so also the lady who goes for a, a delivery will i will never come back they said but nothing happens again she goes for a delivery this man also after having a bath goes back to the normal sea that should not happen after leaving this place with a diploma you should not forget this you should continue if one person continues out of even 125 alumni of 12 years i am the happiest person she may require she may she may expect all 25 of our students to follow i am very skeptical one out of 125 follow i am a happy person till life long you may do it for one month somebody may do it for one year as somebody said it recently i think it's sadguru who said it all students are communists as long as they are students the moment they get married they become socialist once they get employed they become capitalist so that should not change that should not happen you should continue with your vision for which you have come here till you die that should be there and nothing will happen nothing will happen people have, people in the system will try to break you if not suck you i have to tell you this i stood there for five and a half years nothing could break me nothing could suck me i am still here nothing has happened the system is like that it will be easy for you to buckle which you should not do you stand alone that's okay the winner is always alone you don't have company for a winner then he's not a winner is it not so so you are a loner should you should always remember that means you are a winner remember to win you don't do things different things but just do things differently you will be a winner i am very happy to be here to talk this few few words in a random thoughts but i want to tell you this that don't think that only because you have come to a diploma you are going to be ethical we are all here and post also we are also more ethical probably most of the people here but nothing has happened to us at the age of 64 i can tell you nothing has happened to me so nothing will happen to you so you will continue to be ethical nothing is going to happen nothing will change just because somebody again i am repeating that before i conclude you should not allow others to dictate what you should be or what you should not be you are what you think you are you can do no more than you think what you can you can be no more than you think you are so be you are thank you very much for this call
Thank you very much, sir, for those profound words of wisdom. It's like he dived deep and brought in from his practice the pearls that need to be looked at because the pearl is again not a one day find. It's the irritation that causes the pearl to be formed. The constant irritation could make any person endure, sustain, and become better. So instead of being reactive, understanding, facing head on the challenges, and still calling a spade a spade, that's why in the introduction I said man of words and decisive and incisive action. So I think so. Thank you very much, sir, for the message well conveyed. Okay. And uh, I, it's also my honor to ask our uh, uh, request the Honorable Chancellor to give the presidential remarks. Over to you, sir. Good morning to all of you. Thank you. Vice Chancellor Dr. Vijay Kumar, Director, Center for Ethics, Dr. Veena Oswani, respectful members of alumni, management, staff, students, friends from the media, guests, ladies and gentlemen. Warm greetings to all of you. I'm happy that the Center of Ethics is celebrating the 12th year of its inception and celebrating Alumni Day today. A special word of appreciation to our eminent alumni, Dr. Sikia Ballal and Dr. Ron Maskrenas for being a part of the alumni lecture today on the impact of bioethics, clinical ethics, learning in ethical practices. As the first ethical ethics dedicated center in the medical college in India, the Center for Ethics has made commendable progress with the milestone achievements since its inception in 2011. Under the directorship, I'm sorry, under the directorship of Dr. Veena Vaswani. Correctly only my, said. <laughs> my, my artist, congratulations to Veena and her team. I'm thankful to Dr. Vijay Kumar for his wise advice. He has given a strong message to the students. I always believe in ethics in medical practices. I'm also happy to know of the future plans of the center, especially the creation of PhD programs in bioethics, research ethics, and gender ethics, which are not available anywhere in India. It's encouraging to know that the center will also be applying for international grants from Welcome Trust and World Health Organization in order to enhance research ethics. Also noteworthy is the plan to convert a full-time MSc research ethic program into an online distance program, learning program. This will indeed be a great boon to students, both from India and overseas. While once again congratulating Dr. Veena and her dynamic team for these accomplishments, I look forward to the greater success in the years to come. Keep up the excellent work. All the very best to each and every one of you in your future endeavor. Uh, thank you one and all. Jai Hind, Jai Karnataka. Thank you very much, sir, for the inspiring presidential remarks. I call upon Dr. Ravi Baswani to propose a vote of thanks. Honorable Chancellor, sir, we thank you very much for all of us that. Otherwise, only <laughs> Honorable Chancellor, sir, thank you very much. You've always been a source of strength and support for us. We thank you from the bottom of our heart. We thank the Honorable Vice Chancellor, the Registrar, and other statutory officers of the university. Thank you very much.
thank you to the dean in our medical college the speakers for today the alumni and all the other guests who are here and dr amar jasani for being a support all the time thank you dr amar thank you Good. So, we are finished with the inaugural function, but then the Dr. C. K. Balla's lecture will begin in two minutes' time. A little bit of adjustment to the logistics. So, thank you very much. Thank you. No, I don't. What a funny thing. That's why one day you can do. Guys, are you okay? Shall we start? You would like a minute break to breathe deeply, or what? What would you like? We can continue. Fine. Can we move on this side as well, so that uh, it, uh, we can see people on both sides? I usually tend to look at only one side, then I would see blank chairs. So. So once again, hello, and uh, we shall resume the alumni series, and this is especially with reflection, the reflection of how the course has impacted you as a person and your practice, because ultimately, like our VC also said, ethics is not getting a certificate, ethics is not scoring high marks or first or whatever, but ethics is how does it work for you? How does it work for your surrounding and interpersonal relations? And how, at the end of the day, if you can use ethical or theories, principles, learnings, and communication, will you be a better person? Because in, we were very inspired by the feedback we received from the alumni from the year one, two, three. One thing that stood out, they said the interpersonal relations have improved. And they do not disrespect people which they used to do it with arrogance because of the reflective sessions so we believe a lot in reflection so today we have another alumni with us dr ck balal who is a neurosurgeon one of the most famous neurosurgeons of mangalore and what i feel inspired from him when i saw him first deliver a lecture in toastmasters there was a lot of genuineness it wasn't a plastic re uh, rehearsal of something that he rattles out, but it came in the depth of his heart. And then when he joined the course, I was thinking, my goodness, do we have enough to offer him that he can learn on? But then we thought, at least we are very happy that he will interact with us to add to our net knowledge so that the class becomes fulsome when there are a lot of discussions. That is why we insist PG diploma in bioethics or clinical ethics should not be online. They should be face to face. You give some opportunity, somebody to speak up, and then you contest the idea, and then somebody else has an alternate thinking. And uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi is very aware. For hours together, we wouldn't move from an idea. You would get stuck there. But that is what brings us to that. So with that, Dr. C.K. Balal is a great orator also, and he walks the talk. When he talks of ethics, I'm proud to say, I can point and say, this is one example of where you find ethics, because he never told this, but a lot of patients, same thing with Dr. Rohan, because I'm his patient for quite some time. And the way things happen is you look for yourself, how ethics has been embedded and how it is played out and how it is practiced. 
Same thing with Dr. C.K. Ballard. Even at any age, once he even discussed time management with me, because he said, I'm so short of time, what can I do? I said, oh, this is the time management we follow. So I could discuss with you. But I found the sincerity to improve, the sincerity to learn, the sincerity to say, I don't know this, can you explain? And this is what is an attribute of a lifelong learner. So with that, we welcome Dr. C.K. Ballard and then the floor is nice. Good afternoon, everyone. Good, Good afternoon, afternoon sir. Half past 12. <laughs> and, uh, I'm an alumnus of the fifth branch of uh, postgraduate diploma in bioethics and medical ethics. It's my very proud privilege uh, to attend this alumni lecture and to have attended and seen Dr. Vijay Kumar speak. I've had the company of him sitting next to him on a flight uh, to Delhi. Uh, a a non-stop flight from Mangalore to Delhi a good few years ago. And there's so much we talked. And I don't know who talked more. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a big talker in two ways. But we had to make room for one another, be ethical with each other when we were talking and we exchanged a lot of notes. So it was uh, a great privilege to be here today and to have learned uh, from uh, this under the stewardship of Dr. Veena Vaswani, Dr. Ravi Vaswani, Dr. Uma Kulkarni, and so many others. And also my fellow alumni who are here, I've learned a lot from them. And uh, I enjoyed my one year plus here at the Center for Ethics. <clears throat> There's a couplet by Kabir in Hindi, mm. in, uh, actually in Red Bhasha, Guru Gobind Dono Khare. <clears throat> Guru Gobind Dono Khare, Kake La Gopaye, Balihari Guru Apne, Jin Gobind Diyoptai. So, when you're in a session like this, you don't know what to say. We had the prayer, and we had the Gobind shown to us, but I think the teacher is the greatest God. And that's what I learned in the center. You know, the teachers here are like, the more you, the more you want, the more you get. It's like an example which was given to me by my professor of surgery. It's like, uh, you know, only when the calf suckles, milk flows from the calf. So the more you suckle, the more milk you get, even if they try to hold the calf away and tight. Okay. You know, you, you do yearn for the milk and the milk of knowledge that I got here is something that uh, can never be replaced. Now, why this, uh, so I was just thinking about the 12th year. 12th year is very significant. There are 12 months in a year. Jupiter goes down the sun once in 12 years. And our Masaka Abhisheka of Gomateshwara is held once in 12 years. Mm -hmm. Kumbh Mela is held once in 12 years. So 12, at least for me today, being here, <laughs> will be etched in my memory because all they have spoken here before, presented a paper at a conference, this will happen. And uh, I pay my special obeisance to my guru, Professor Veena Vaswani, Dr. Ravi Vaswani, Dr. Umar Karni, Umar Kulkarni, Dr. Jisani, even Dr. Sunil, the Pandya was here, Dr. Yeah. Sunil Pandya, so many others. And Dr. Rama. Yes. Uh, Mala you know, Ramnathan. Yes, Mala Ramnathan. And so many other things that I learned here. So I'm deeply indebted to this center. And there's something that I've got here which I must share. And uh, I drink, I drink from this cup every day. Drink from this cup every day. This was the memento or a parting gift which was given by Veena and Ravi to me. And uh, what was shown, the emblem was here. And uh, I did not contemplate so much on the emblem, but I delved more into this cup from which I drink my morning tea. For the last so many wonderful thank you you can see this change so i'm not telling a lie <laughs> and my wife asked why are you taking it i said i'll tell you the story later so before i go on to let you know uh, how this course has helped me and in me my in my professional work as a neurosurgeon i find it was more to satisfy my curiosity like what doctor uh, your vice chancellor said just now, Kumar. Dr. Vijay Kumar, that we were kind of, uh, to some extent, the blind leading the blind in some way. We never had a structured course in medical 
genetics, bioethics, medical ethics, we just uh, imbibed it from our teachers. If the teachers are ethical, at least in medical practice, so also in arts courses, I'm sure, the students will turn out to be ethical. So you lead the way and you talk the way. If your professor does it, then you do it. But you find your professor taking money in the OPD under the, under the table from each OPD patient, then you think it's passe. It's all right to do that. And so you have to set an example to your students. And I had great professors in Delhi. I graduated from Delhi University, Malan Azad Medical College. It's great. We even had a blind professor of surgery called Dr. Nigam, who became blind because of the retinal hemorrhage. And the way he used to teach us was amazing. The way he used to teach us was really amazing. His daughter turned out to be a cardiac surgeon, one of the first lady cardiac surgeons in India. And um, it was very heartening to see how he would come every morning on the dock at nine. White shirt, white trousers. Those days, professors used to wear whites. And uh, he will come and ask, Kitne log hai class mein? Sometimes I would be the only one. Because sometimes the students would think we were four postgraduates in surgery at that time as to, you know, what about palpation? What is he going to tell us? And he says, um, if there was silence, Achha, tum akele aayo. You know, that he would still take the full one hour class on the patient. And we palpate and tell us how to look for the liver, how to look for the spleen and all that. So if your teachers are ethical, you will be ethical and, and you imbibe. So ethics, I feel, is something that you imbibe as you go on. But having said that, it's very important that, and I congratulate you for having registered in this course, because nothing can beat, beat a structured kind of learning. You know, it is like learning to play the piano. You think, what is there in it? But then unless you have a teacher who teaches the keyboard, teaches do re mi fa so la ti, and you know how to, like I've seen my uh, grandson who's about six, how he plays with two hands and all that. And now he tells me, I don't play well enough. Now, so, <laughs> because he has a teacher who's taught him and is not playing by the ear. You may be a musician, play by the ear, but unless you're taught, you can't. And same, so is also the music of ethics, that unless you're properly taught, you will not know where you're going wrong. The something that I learned from Lina and the team here is that, you know, these very relative terms, I am very ethical. He is a very, very ethical, you know. There's nothing like very ethical. It's full stop, ethics, full stop, period. Is it ethical or non-ethical? It cannot be very true, true, not so true. Then what is the difference between falsehood and truth? It's absolute. Ethics is absolute. You may create your own kind of, uh, you know, benchmark saying, you know, for me beyond this is ethics and below this is all unethical. But that's not the way. It's a, it's a, you know, when you finish a race, you reach that line. You know, only then you are declared a winner. The first, you know, you have to reach that line. You know, so also you have to keep on achieving it. I'm not saying that we're all born ethical. I don't think we can say that. It be being very holier than thou and say we're all born ethical. We have these moments of weakness, but we have to question ourselves and see whether they are giving up to that weakness. There has to be constant churning, constant manthan, you know. Only when you, you know, churn the yogurt, you get butter out of it. You know, the the sagar had to, you had to have that to get. First came Visha, Samudra, which, Mantan. Samudra Mantan, which Shiva drank, and he became Nilakantha. And then he gave to all the gods the Amrit. You know, so you have to go through a churning in life, and that churning is not in in public. The churning is an internal churning. Internal churning is required. Question yourself each and every time as to whether you are being ethical in what you do or not. And my question is, why is it that you cannot be ethical? Why is it that you cannot be ethical? Even in your most, in your weakest of moments, you can be ethical. In your weakest of moments, you can be ethical. I had this attitude of know it all. You know, I had that thing, you know, I know, call it up. I know everything. Top of the class always knows everything. But it's not true. Only when you look into yourself, you realize how little you know how little you know. 
and the big ocean of knowledge has been something, you know, I've been taught to swim in it by the center here. Now coming to the topic proper is how has this helped me in my profession as, uh, as a new researcher? I think that's probably what you want to know. When I joined this course, I told a couple of friends, you know, they said, no one can teach an old dog new tricks. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, I'm quite happy to be a dog in the center <laughs> and uh, learn some new tricks in ethics, which I don't know. And uh, that's how I started. And the other, other stimulus was Veena Vaswani, younger than me, and taking that course in uh, Erasmus Mundus. Yes. And she was doing that. And she was a Toastmaster with us. And uh, I said, if, oh my God, if she can do it, why can't I do it? I will not go with Erasmus Mundus because I've got all the cutting to do. <laughs> uh, but then, you know, I'll join. And she told me that. Absolutely. She told me that you wait. We'll be starting a course and you can join them. Prophetic so, words. Yeah, I, I remember that. Coming to the, you know, the places where, if, you know, dilemma means two horns, you know, you have these two horns and, uh, and you're always in a dilemma. There are a lot of dilemmas. Some things are very, very clear cut, you know, but some things are not clear. And I find the more you know, the more you look into yourself, more often you'll have dilemma than not. More often than not, you'll have dilemma. So for one of the first came to me was about organ donation in my clinical practice. I'll, because that's a topic that's been given to me as to how this course in bioethics has helped me in my practice as a neurosurgeon. Um, any neuroscientists here? Anyone neurologist, neuro, neurosurgeon? No, neuroscientist, neurobiologist, no one. Anyway, uh, it's, a, it's a universal thing. You know, if it affects me, it might affect you also. And if you learn from it, you can. Organ donation is something that I really, you know, I learned. And uh, this is a moment when I had, and this is going back, way back, when I really didn't have. But then I kind of reframed it and looked into it myself was when a young child was asked for organ donation. I mean, not, they didn't ask him, ask the parents. It was a head injury, child with head injury, uh, brain dead, the, you know, your usual stipulated 24 hours had gone by and all of them was obviously in a, he left 15, 12 year old, were all intact, BP was normal and was an ideal kind of thing for organ donation. And my boss uh, came and uh, said, uh, spoke to the parents who were clergy, as you know, in Church of England, they marry the priest uh, and uh, he was sitting and he said, uh, he's brain dead. No. Uh, please donate the organs. And he went away. And I was a senior registrar at that time in a uh, uh, hospital for sick children in Manchester. And uh, it had fell upon me as it had to. And as all you know, the, the treating team, you know, does not, you know, you have called two independent. And that had all been done. So the priest said to me, you're not giving the consent. You don't know. I was very surprised because this appeared as somebody who were very elevated people would have said yes and was taken aback. And he said, uh, the reason, he said, why so? I took a chair by the side, outside the ICU and pulled a chair and sat near them. We didn't like the way we were asked. We didn't like the way we were asked. Then I said, it would be my job to convince them because the next day my boss will say, why did you waste those organs? Waste those organs. Why did you let them go waste? So I thought I must do my best. And I pulled the challenge, talked to them. And I said, uh, why is it? He said, it's a way people talk. We were actually prepared to donate the organs. So it's sometimes the way you say things makes a difference. I'm not going to delve into, you all know, we we'll learn it. But there's a way of saying things which makes a difference. You know, you can see, you can serve the bitterest of pills in the sweetest of ways and it will be accepted. And you can the sweetest gulab jamun in the world, but it may not be accepted. You just throw it there and say, take it or leave it. So there's a way of saying things. And in organ donation, there's something that I learned. A lot of times you can convert the unconverted to your point of view if you say things properly. And as you all read recently in Father Mullahs, we had this young unmarried woman who had uh, whose brothers decided for her, and you know, and uh, she did not, uh, she not was not holding a card, kidney card, anything like that, but all including skin was donated. 
you know, and the brothers were very gracious. It was the way they were talking and told them, you know, the patient is brain dead, then would you? And we spent a lot of time. So counseling is something that I learned here. Importance of counseling, importance of saying, you know, saying things properly. Then the other uh, aspect that I learned here was about uh, consent for surgery. That is something that I, you know, I learned from Veena. Um, that uh, Professor Veena. No, 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 please, please, uh, Veena. I learned uh, here is about uh, there's nothing like high risk consent. And I've been spreading this message uh, and it's, it's been like talking to a wall. It, I've not been able to move even, you know, administration in one iota. Not even one bit. Consent is consent. There's nothing like high risk consent. Consent. And this is something that I learned here. And this has affected my practice. You know, we operate, uh, you know, like all of you know, uh, not trying to, you know, stand on a high pedestal and say we, you know, operate, you know, very big things. Oh, you could be, you know, removing a tooth, which is just as important as, uh, you know, operating on an aneurysm in the brain. Even a patient with a tooth, Removal can, can lead to death. And, it, you know, it almost happened to my brother when I was an intern in Delhi and uh, his tooth had been removed and uh, uh, at the Irvin Hospital, the you know, government hospital. And uh, I was an intern at that time. So I used to come home on weekends. He had it done on Saturday. I reached home and my mother said, he's bleeding, he's splitting, you know. I said, what has he done? He said he had uh, hot tea and he removed that pack which was put there. I said, what happened? So he had not been counseled. You know, consent had been taken, but he had not been told. You're, it doesn't finish at consent. You have to counsel the patient before the consent. And I went back to the lady dentist. I took him back those days in, a, in an auto rickshaw and back, took him back. We didn't have a car at home and uh, went and spoke to the dentist. And she said, Mary duty nahi abhi. You know, I'm not coming. They were in the staff quarters. And uh, I had to call and uh, someone else. There was somebody called Dr. Tukral, you know, one of the doyens of dentistry. And he came in the night and he sutured and said, But but I need taki garam cheese nai penia, your pack kyon hataya, why you removed the pack? You're not supposed to have hot. So this is where. So even small things can go wrong. So there's nothing like high risk or less risk or more risk. Consent is consent. And this I found. I learned in my practice because some of my colleagues, somebody, you know, they tell the anesthetists when things are going wrong, this very bad aneurysm you're posting, hyper diabetic, hypertensive, but I've taken consent for death on the table. But, you know, just because you've taken consent to death on the table, what about controlling all the other things before you take the patient to surgery? Have you asked the physician? No. It's a very bad risk surgery. This came to me again in, now we do wiring, you know, what is known as coiling of aneurysms versus clipping of aneurysms. And this happened to me very, very recently when a colleague's wife suffered from subarachnoid hemorrhage when she was driving to Giddy and she fell and had a, nearly had an accident, but it was not a head injury. She actually suffered from brain hemorrhage, subarachnoid hemorrhage. We found neck stiffness and all the other signs were there. She was becoming drowsy. But the husband, the pediatrician, wanted to know, I'm not giving any names here, wanted to know, you know, what, what would be the best thing to do? So my cousin, who's HOD, in, in the department where this lady works, rang me. I said, the two things which can be done, you know, we'll talk after that. Let the angiogram be done because the patient was improving from the initial ictus. And uh, they said, if it's a broad neck, you do coiling. If it's a very small neck, you know, narrow neck, it'll be difficult to coil, coil can't enter in. Then we'll do clipping, you know, but, you know, one has to see. But then, uh, when the patient was admitted under the neuroradiologist. I'm telling you all this example because no better way to illustrate what I've learned example. than through examples. I can talk on and on benefits of coiling versus surgery. Unless I give an example, you will not understand. And this is how this, is how this course has impacted me. If something is not good enough for me, it is not good enough for X, Y, and Z. So do unto others as you would have it done to yourself is one of the most ethical lessons that I've learned, you know, you know, which perhaps I knew, but it was driven home to me in a structured manner here in the center. And I benefit tremendously from it. So, um, they said, saw the angiogram, it was easily coilable. But the person was admitted, because we always have to have a surgeon to see the patient as well. Just in case something goes wrong while coiling, the surgeon should be informed. Uh, so that 
in case something happens, he's available to do the clipping. You have to hold hands. We are colleagues in crime or in doing good, whatever you say. When we treat people, we're all members of a team. We're all members of a team. And we have to have this courtesy towards one another, saying that if you're doing, I'm stand by. If I'm doing, you have to stand by and be available. So for interventional radiology, interventional radiology, this is very, very important. They're doing something. If something goes wrong, person should be available. It's important when you do angioplasty, if you tear the artery while putting a stent, a cardiac surgeon should be available. So they always inform a cardiac surgeon that you're doing a case. You're, who's on duty? Which team is on duty? Not a particular person. So similarly here, we needed a neurosurgeon to be available. But the family was told, you're admitted under neuroradiology. So you take his consent and do under him. You know, um, I'm in the operation theater. You know, I'm not coming. Three calls were sent to the surgeon to come. Admitted under radiology. Let him do and we'll see what happens. Finally, an assistant was sent who said the same thing. Admitted under radiologist. Let them do. Otherwise, it has to be admitted under us. So here, what Dr. Uh, our Chancellor, Vice Chancellor said, you know, this becomes very, very relevant. Why do you want to do it when another way of is available? Finally, I said, don't worry, I'm available. You know, we'll see. But coiling is the best treatment for this and do the coiling. And, uh, you know, thank uh, whatever you say, God, you believe in God or destiny or you're an atheist or agnostic, whatever. Things went okay. It was easily coilable. The person has recovered and gone home. Whatever little deficit she had, it recovered. <laughs> so, this is very important. Ego should not come in the way. This is what I've learned in treating a patient. Because it could be next. You could be the one next time. Or your near and dear could be the next one next time. So, as a surgeon, I've learned this. That in ethics, it's very important to be very, very clear. You know, And there's nothing like more ethical or less ethical. Ethics is ethics. If something is not good enough, then it is not good enough. And I asked in a webinar. They were talking about big aneurysm, giant aneurysm, so clipping. Okay, giant aneurysms are one of the most easily coilable. Not that I'm afraid of operating, but during our training, coiling was just starting. But now coiling is almost universal. 90% of aneurysms in USA are done by coiling. In All India Institute, my junior colleagues does even 6 millimeter aneurysms by coiling. Who would want a head cut on the head? The risk of epilepsy, hemiplegia and all that, when you can easily go out to the hospital in four days' time, it's nicely coiled. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you like it? I would like it for my, uh, for my cousin. I would like it for myself. I would like it for my wife, for anyone for that matter. So why not? So charity begins at home. It's one of the most important within ethics. And what is ethical for you is ethical for another one. What is not ethical for you is and not ethical for another person as well. When I asked in the webinar, my question in the chat box was easily ignored. When I said that, I want to know what the faculty would like done if one of their near and dear ones has a giant aneurysm. Would they like clipping or coiling? Total silence. Just... Then I asked this question. That privately. speaks volumes. This speaks volumes. So just because a drug company is selling coils or a drug company is selling clips, you don't decide. Okay? Because there are commissions. Large commissions. So that's about. Then... <clears throat> Uh, there's another thing that I learned here is about plagiarism. Veena is, uh, is very, very clear about first author, second author, third author, nth, nth author, and also how much it is. For the first time, I came to know from Veena and her team, Ravi, that you have this kind of, uh, uh, kind of software, which you can put, put an article through and see how much of it is plagiarized. And I've seen this happen again and again. You know, people... Plagiarism in medical publications, plagiarism in neurosurgical articles where things are, you know, just and you're not given a credit or a lot of your article is stolen, put and the normal. I had written the first chapter in the Indian textbook of neurosurgery, operative neurosurgery on shunt infections and how to prevent them and how to deal with them and what kind of shunts to use and the technique of using it. Recently, I looked at an article uh, which has come again and uh, I was not mentioned. I picked up the phone. I picked up the phone and talked to my colleague from Bombay, very junior colleague. I said, Mera naam to likha nahi, kuch nahi bola. Koi baat nahi, but at least you quoted the chapter. You could have quoted the chapter in the book. You need not put my name. You didn't do that. I said, we'll do that in the, in the next edition. 
So sometimes you have to speak for yourself and point out if things are going wrong. There's no, no good suffering, you know, just because you're going to displease someone. You may displease a lot of people. My boss, uh, Ben Dawson, used to say, make an enemy a day was his motto. <laughs> make an enemy a day, not make a friend a day, because you may displease. Huh? Okay? You cannot please everyone every day of the life. There will be some people you will displease from what you say by being outspoken. But then, you know, you have to speak when it is required. Being silent when it is wrong is being done is just as unethical as trying to show and do the right things when you're on your own. When crime is being done, when things are going wrong, to be quiet is as good as being a partner in crime or a partner in murder. So that is something that I learned also in, uh, in my practice as a neurosurgeon from the center. Please do that when my time is up. Oh, it's not it. Okay. okay. I learned this, this is what happened in ethical practice. I learned in one of the operation theaters when it was being planned. A very junior surgeon came and said, there are uh, insects and flies coming into the operation theater and no one is saying anything. You know, we have to put, now we put that, you know, an umbrella, like a fan, which, you know, prevents a fan, which drives everything out as you enter in. You probably know, but it's kept in a lot of places, like an air curtain, like an air curtain. And uh, a new surgeon who came, they said, uh, you know, has never complained about, you know, mosquitoes and flies coming into the operation. What you upstart, a new surgeon who joined our team, saying, what this upstart is saying, you know, um, that ever head of the department, head of the institution wanted to ask me, you know, as to, doctor, you never complained about it. The substart is coming and saying the mosquitoes coming and all that. So what have I been doing? I said, they've probably been swatting the flies and mosquitoes before me. <laughs> <laughs> and others have done it for me. But things have changed. You know, what the young person is saying is right. We need an air curtain. So just because I've tolerated it and a new person comes and says, this is a better method. You should also have the humility and accept the right thing. It's not a question of, you know, you may find that somebody very junior sets the trend and uh, shows that what you've been doing could be wrong and you learn from that. And this is another thing I've learned in from here and putting into practice. The company, very, very, very junior person can show the mirror to you and say, look, hey, you're here. You know, this is what is wrong in you. Even the way you deal, even you speak to one of the people, one of my very good uh, mentors, uh, uh, a very dear friend of mine, who's a chartered accountant, said to me, you know, the way you say things sometimes, you know, is, is wrong. The way you say things. So you could perhaps say the same thing in a better way and will be more easily accepted. And this is something also I learned from here, that you can say things nicely and turn people from being your adversary to being on your side of the team. And that's no, that again is ethical. So I'm not going to talk about the theory of ethics, but how yeah, learning okay. has yeah. you know, helped me. Vina talked about time planning. Uh, I was almost in tears. Vina knows about that. I had so many things and people pulling me in different directions at the same time. Do this, do that, operation schedule, this schedule, conference, paper, you know, so painting, many other things. Painting of the clinic. Also. Painting of the clinic is going on. I did not know how to plan time. And she gave me that, you know, the square. You know, with yeah. four yeah, quadrants. quadrants. And the most important thing, the less important thing, the one you can shell for one week, then you can shell for one month. And a prioritize. And this is what I've learned. And tremendously benefited. You know, so this kind of thing also goes on. Not only do you have professors, you know, with you here in the center of reading, you also have friends for life. You have friends, people, thank you in your moments of distress and ask them for advice. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was very worried. That's another thing I learned, is that uh, when the exam was coming, <laughs> somebody said, don't get a writer's cramp and you know, say that I'm going to appear in the supplementary exam. <laughs> because you cannot write a three hour paper. I said, no, I operate for 16 hours. You know, my hands are quite strong, but my heart is not strong. <laughs> I don't know whether I know everything that you know, and the questions to answer. She said, Veena and Ravi said, we'll sit for coffee in Ocean Pearl. You come prepared and we'll throw questions at you and we'll see how well you're prepared. So where can you get a center better than that? Where the guru, you know, is available at your beck and call. 
Hello, hello, hello. 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 You know, not just engineering. You can do degree in science and so many. Other. So there's other things that you learn. These are known as spin-off benefits. Spin-offs. You know, spin-offs. You buy one, you get two. Here you buy one, you get five. You know, you cannot have a better place than that, right? So these are all the things that I've learned from here. And um, there's one mistake I made today, a confession, that my mobile was not switched off. That is another thing I learned. From this place, a lot of people, places they say turn off your mobile when you enter a meeting. But in this center, it is almost you know eyebrows are raised, and when Vina does like that with her eyes glaring at her, you know <laughs> you must you will be shivering in your shoes <laughs> because you know whose mobile was it and she will spot you. It is there, there, or there. So that's another thing I learned here is that you have to switch your mobile today because two relatives at the same time you would have seen continuous calls coming. Somebody is being admitted unconscious, but that does not justify that because there is another method of keeping it silent and still answering. So that courtesy. That's another thing that we must learn, you know, from places which you go to and see how you learn from other people. I'm I'm open to questions. I'm available to answer. But uh, I think I learned a lot also from Doctor your Vice Chancellor's uh, Vijay Kumar's talk, and he can just rattle off. Lesser mortals like us have to prepare a little bit, you know, and uh, and uh, be available to answer questions. There's so many things which have come to my mind, and I just dotted on some points: consent, changes in a center, changes in your practice if they're ethical. Most important is commission, succumbing to commission. You know, drug companies, instrument makers come with various kinds of things, you know, and say you use this kind of interpreter screw, you use this kind of thing for your operation. You know why something else which is going on okay for so many years you don't can't try it. sell to me because other things. So you know, all these things I've learned have tremendously benefited from being the center. I'm sure you too will benefit from. It. But don't forget to take the cup like this from here. Is it still available? <laughs> yeah, from which you can drink the cup of ethics. I call it the cup of ethics, which you must sip from every morning and be prepared for the day and for the months and the years ahead. Thank you very much, and thanks for that. Thank you, thank you very much. I thank you for the erudite way you brought out how ethics has impacted you, and also like how not to do something. And keeping patient first as the motto is very important. Where some of the corporates are looking at return on investments as the motto. So when there are these diverse objectives to be fulfilled, then the patient care literally gets hijacked by return on investment. And we are not doing justice for the profession that we are engaged to. So you brought that dichotomy beautifully. And also the teamwork of how people are like Greek warriors. Individually, they do best. But in a team, I'm not going to talk. Let that person talk. Because it's very much of an attitude with surgeons. It's very much of an attitude of the most super specialists that even for the patient's sake, if we say, when is he doing? No, 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 you don't ask him, you ask me. I can give you my time, I don't care about him. But you're talking about one patient and he's not compartmentalized. So this is something that we need to go beyond an individual attitude to be working in the team because at the end of the team, at the end of the day, it is those who work in team that have more benefit with each other with collegiality and there's a goodwill than a lone worker who at the end would find it difficult. So most of the surgical cases though, especially when you have a Consumer Protection Act, because you have not worked in a team, in the team it's very difficult to make mistake because somebody is watching your back. So we need to inculcate that as a part of ethical principle. So uh, I uh, come to the end of this meeting and I'd also like to ask our uh, online participants if they have any reflection or would Amar would like to say something in this regard? There's something that I just forgot, which I noted on here, shortage of time is about medical, you know, the, the pictures and other things that you share. You know, when you take a patient's photograph in the operation theater, when you take photographs of uh, a specimen after surgery, a tumor removed, um, you know, 
all those things. When you do that, you must take the patient's permission. There's something again, you know, which has been driven home in the center that you can't just. And I've seen pictures going viral. Now I tell the patients, you know, not show it off like a trophy. Ah, huh? such a big meningioma removed by such a balari. No, you know, it cannot go viral all over the world, all over the time. It's, the world is a very small place now. You're not in an island by yourself. It travels, you know, and it'll be unethical to share the pictures of patients with colleagues without the patient's permission, which is again something that is probably you think you know, but the penny doesn't drop unless you've been taught about it in a structured manner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And we have one question that is uh, from Poonam yeah. that uh, ethics is related to applied branch. Why? Actually, ethics is related to any branch, not only applied. Everybody and every branch can do well applying it in a structured way. So if it is to a surgical uh, intervention, then the application, the form of ethics would be, is this the best outcome? Will this give a best outcome for the patient? If it is a newer advance, it will be, how will it look up five years from now? Like for ultrasonography, when it came, there was a mad rush to get it done. We did not realize that it was later on being used for sex determination. So that is how there is any branch, it does well with ethics. And you will also realize there are different ways of embedding ethics in different, different areas. So uh, thank you for the question. And I also uh, thank you for uh, Dr. Shripad Mandela. Yes, thank you for the overview. You said the overview was excellent. Yeah, that's also because oh, Dr. Uma is one of the workhorses who has taken the center forward with a lot of other uh, faculty as well as the alumni contributing to that. Thank you. And for all of uh, uh, students who have wished us, have a very nice day. We are bringing the meeting to a close. Is there any other reflection? Anybody would like to give a short one or two sentences reflection we are open for before we close. Anybody would like to say something? I would just like to share what happened during this uh, uh, inaugural program. Uh, when Zayed was here to offer the prayers, uh, his mom texted me and told me to take a video of him uh, offering the prayers. And then his dad also walked in and came and told me to take a video of him. But I feel so nervous. You know, I've not asked a child if I can do this video. So I walked up to him and told my mom and dad have asked me to take a video. Can I take a video of yours? Yeah, sometimes <laughs> ethics does that. You become less confident about action. You would confidently do me if you didn't know much about it. So you'd go and touch a child or pat a child. Now you'll think twice. Oh, the child has individuality. Would she like the, would the child like it? So yeah, that's right. So thank you. Thank you for that. So with that, we, are, we shall close the meeting if there are no other reflections. And I thank you one and all from the bottom of my heart. I thank the Center for Ethics and all the faculty. I also thank Forensic for hosting for so long till we are now independent and we are on our own. But we did our humble beginnings in the Department of Forensic. So we have spent a lot of time talking to them. And because I was in ethics, that gave me a long rope where a lot of teaching and everything was done by the other faculty in forensic. So, and I thank all the faculty who have been a part of us and uh, thank the speakers once again for the reflection, which was truly from the heart, the way it can be taken up, the way it can be embedded, the way it can be looked at. So thank you for all the people who have come and sat with us. And I would also request you as a housekeeping announcement, please stay back and have lunch and go. And for the online people, we can release you to have a delicious lunch and think that we are offering to you. Because if you were to be here, we would have offered it to you. Thank you. Thank you, Lata.